Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomed sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after all the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven when over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Let's take a moment to pray before we come and have a look at this together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the privilege of knowing something of your heart, Lord. And as we uh, look at these first couple of parables tonight, we pray that you give us a deeper understanding of your heart. And we'll be, be amazed by your heart uh, for sinful people like us. And um, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, opening question. Do you ever do you ever get a nagging feeling uh, that God is something of a miser? A miser, someone who hates giving. Um, there are lots of misers in history gone by. Um, I heard this week about a guy called Wellington R. Burt. And uh, let me read this about him. Wellington R. Burt. He was a timber baron from Michigan. And he was one of the richest men in America at the turn of the last century, well, was over 100 years ago. Uh, he's most remembered for his tight fistedness towards his own family. After his death in 1919, his will was found to contain smaller annual payments to his children and grandchildren than to his domestic servants. A clause specified that none of Burt's descendants could receive the bulk of his fortune until 21 years after the death of his last grandchild. The outraged offspring appealed, but to no avail. The condition was finally fulfilled in 2010, when more than 100 million was distributed between 12 of Bert's great, great, great grandchildren. Wow, okay. He was a miser. I mean, that is, he didn't like giving at all. I'm a silly thing in a way, but do you, do, do you ever get the feeling that God is a bit like that? He doesn't actually like giving. I mean, I'm thinking of the kind of thought that can go through our head, like, God never seems to answer my deepest prayers. God always seems to take more than he gives. That, that kind of thing, that kind of nagging thought that we can have. Um, yeah, we're in this kind of new series of three sermons we're going to have on the theme of lost and loved uh, from this one chapter of Luke's gospel account of Jesus' life, Luke chapter 15. Uh, these three parables, the three parables, but they're not, they're not separate, really. They, they build on each other. Uh, they're all told at one occasion. Uh, so they're, they're, they're together. And we're going to see that, in particular, that two things that need kind of really careful defining or perhaps even redefining uh, what it means to be lost and what it means to be loved. And we're going to be thinking when a lot about this over the next few weeks. So first of all, God's love in summary. How do we, how do we think about this? Um, next week, we'll be looking at the start of the parable of the prodigal son, as commonly known as. But the word prodigal is interesting. Uh, what does it mean? Um, we might think, we usually think that the word prodigal means uh, wayward, runaway, prodigal. But actually, that's not right. Prodigal really means wild spender. So here's a definition from a dictionary. Prodigal means uh, someone who spends money or resources freely or foolishly. 
wastefully extravagant. So that's prodigal, wild spender. Um, not, it's not about kind of being a runaway, that kind of thing. God's love. Uh, secondly, uh, what it means to be lost. Spiritually, we'll be thinking about this a lot. What does it mean to be lost? It's, it's, we can think of being lost as kind of having no direction. Don't know which way to go. You know, any direction will do really, but just follow your dream. Find the direction. But lost is not about that, Jesus shows us here. Spiritually lost is about a lostness that is kind of deep in our heart. It's a heart lostness. And Jesus is going to be saying a lot that we all need to hear both these things and have them kind of redefined in our hearts. And particularly, perhaps, if we are not a Christian, we're not trusting in Jesus for ourselves. Uh, that is because uh, we don't like God. That's the state of the heart before we come to Christ. We run from him. We don't want to know God. But it's also a thing for Christians as well, because it's very easy as Christians to grow cold to God, to drift from him, to grow cold to what he's like. So it's important for all of us. So the question we're looking at really is how to not be lost in God's sight. And the answer is be amazed at God's prodigal love. God is not a miser. He's a wild spender. Be amazed at that. And so week one to this week, which kind of sets up this pattern. And then next week and the week after, we're going to dig kind of more into that lostness and God's love. We're going to look at it in a, a three sections tonight. And so first of all, um, be amazed, not offended. Be amazed, not offended. So I'm going to read from the beginning of chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. In summary, from these verses, we, we see that if we get the extravagance of God's love, it will either offend us or amaze us. Uh, so in this, these verses here, notice who is flocking to Jesus. Tax collectors are flocking to Jesus. Tax collectors, in other words, kind of collaborators. Boo, a hit. You're not meant to like them. Uh, they're flocking to Jesus. Also, sinners are flocking to Jesus. So the most kind of immoral people in society are flocking to him. They are clearly amazed at Jesus. They're coming towards him. But then notice who's offended by that. Pharisees are offended. In other words, the Jewish and religious clerics and also the teachers of the law, they're offended. Uh, together, these people are the, well, they're the moralists. For them, life is all about right and wrong, right and wrong. They are offended at Jesus. What is offending them? Well, Jesus is attracting sinners. They're coming to him. So, uh, uh, these moralists are thinking, what's wrong with Jesus? Why are they going to him? That surely shows something wrong with him. But also more than that, Jesus is befriending these sinners. He's moving towards them. You know, one commentator said that by eating with them, Jesus is binding himself in community with these uh, sinful, Im most immoral people. And that, that just offends um, uh, the moralists, the, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. So do you see kind of God's extravagant love described here? Jesus is sitting and eating with these people that the religious people wouldn't at all. That is an extravagant love from God. And they need to sit on that and see his heart in that. Uh, one thing also with that is that being offended, it's important to realize that being offended can blind us to God's love like the Pharisees etc but that's why the Pharisees and teachers of the law they need this lesson from Jesus is why he's going to teach these parables they're blinded to God's love now of course a sense of right and wrong and morals is very very good we need that we have that conscience and you know, being offended by something can be a very normal reaction to prejudice or whatever you know of course understandable but morals on their own can destroy, actually. So if you're only interested in what's right and wrong, right and wrong, 
Well, then you quickly have a real sense of comparison. Who's more right? Who's more wrong? Uh, that can lead to pride if you see yourself as more right than other people. Uh, and it can lead to hatred of people you disapprove of who are in the wrong. And if God, if we're hearing that God loves even the most immoral people, then actually you're going to end up hating God because he loves the people you hate. So being offended can blind us to God's love. But more positively, being offended can actually be a stepping stone to seeing God's love better. Um, so think um, for yourself, when do you get offended? When do you get offended um, by someone being kind of immoral or saying something immoral, something you just don't like? And so it can be a test at that time. Where's that happened? So think to when that happens. Think, do you accept that God could love that person? I'm deeply offended by that person and what they've just said to me, but God could love that person. Jesus could eat with them and sit with them. He would befriend them. That's a bit of a test for us. So you could try it. I don't know if you go on Twitter. I go on Twitter sometimes. Uh, I usually regret it. Um, but it's, you're on Twitter and you receive a retweet someone says look at what this person said that's outrageous how dare they and you might get offended by what you've read well here's the test at that point when that happens think that person seems so immoral so wrong so wrong in what they've written but god could love that person jesus would befriend them jesus would attract them that's how extravagant jesus's love is and I think to a tweet, um, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was a tweet. Uh, it was um, there were some missionaries who had been preparing to go to a part of the jungle in the Amazon uh, to share the good news of Jesus and live with the people there. And this announcement on Twitter had received a torrent of abuse from people who said this is the most outrageous thing. We shouldn't do this in the 21st century. And to see this abuse was really horrible. And I got offended in kind of seeing that, reading that. But looking back on that, the test for me is that same test. Do I believe that God could love those people who've so offended me, so sent out that abuse on Twitter, that Jesus would befriend and sit with them and eat with them? I'm offended, but that shows me actually how extravagant God's love is. So that's this first point, be amazed, not offended. If we get the extravagance of God's love, it will either offend us or it can amaze us amaze us uh, let's move on let's move on secondly be amazed not afraid be amazed not afraid what we see here is that if you are afraid that god would not take you back or be amazed at his wild determination to find you and bring you home I'm going to read from verse three. So Jesus told them, these moralists, Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And then skipping on to verse eight, the second parable. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? In these two parables, notice in each case that the search here is very careful, very careful. So verse 4, verse 8, they search until he finds it, until she finds it, a careful search. Now, with the woman and the coin, actually archaeologists kind of tell us that... Um, uh, the flooring in those times, it was kind of very loosely fitted stones in the floor. And people seem to apparently lose coins down them the whole time. There were loads of coins they found in these floors. Uh, and what this woman would have done is to sweep the floor to try and kind of um, you know, nudge out the coin and kind of hear it jangling about. That's how she would have found it. So she's searching carefully. And likewise, the shepherds as well, you know, you think of searching for one sheep in open country you're going to have to search hard. That's, you know, going to be a difficult thing. You're going to have to search hard. Careful search. 
But here's the thing, more importantly, actually, even more importantly, in each case, the search is very careful, but it's also very careless. It's careless. Um, now a coin that uh, would have been a drachma, that would have been a day's wages. That's a lot, that's a lot of money. But especially with the sheep, I mean, a sheep would be worth a lot, but think about it, one out of a hundred sheep, 99 left. What does reason dictate at this point? Reason would dictate, shepherd, cut your losses, count your blessings, protect the 99. Don't leave them on their own, protect them. And the shepherd here, Jesus says, says, stuff that, I'm going after the one. Stuff the 99, I'm going after that one, I want that one. Uh, imagine, uh, imagine you're a boss of a vaccine transport company. Okay, go with me on this. Uh, and at the end of the day, you have a colleague under you who comes back and says, boss, I had an interesting day. Can I tell you about it? Okay, what happens? And this guy says to you, okay, I was driving my lorry full of vaccines, brilliant, really important. And then I thought I'd lost one, one. And I had loads in the lorry, but I thought it's lost one and I just couldn't, um, it was driving me mad. So um, I stopped and I took out all the vaccines from the lorry because I wanted to drive faster. And it, anyway, so I took them out and put them on in the lay-by. Uh, by the way, it was quite stormy. So it wasn't very good weather anyway, but it's fine. Um, put all the vaccines on the lay-by and then I turned around and drove uh, quickly. And then I found the vaccine and I found it. I found it. it took me a long time, but I found it. If you were the boss, what would you say? You would say, you stupid man. That is the dumbest thing. Why did he do that? What were you thinking? You're crazy. And that's exactly the point. It's crazy. It's really crazy. God is saying, I would do that for you. I'd go after you. You'd be the one I'd go after you. I'd leave, I'd leave, I'd go after you. Crazy. Do you believe that about God? Do you believe that yourself? It might be hard to believe that God would come after you like that. But to be more specific, are you ever kind of afraid to turn to God? If you're not a Christian and you've never turned to God, you're considering it for the first time, that might be quite a scary thing. You know, would God accept me, actually, would he? But also for Christians, been Christians for many years, we can have that kind of the same thing, you know. But I've just mucked up again so many times. So would he have me back again this time, really? We can have those thoughts. I know I've had those kind of thoughts. I remember... Uh, a friend from a, a previous church who, well, he admitted that he, he just hadn't prayed for a long time, a long time. And he said, it's been such a long time and I've, I've left it so long that I think I need to pray a really big prayer when I come back and pray to God for the first time. It's got to be impressive. It's got to be big. God would say, no, no, not at all. Don't be afraid whether I'll accept you back or not. I will accept you home again. It's easy to have those thoughts, what are you afraid of, you know? Well, I think for us, kind of, for Christians, it could be a different fear. It could be a fear that kind of, you know, we talk about in church about, uh, as we talked about tonight already, about sharing the good news of Jesus with our friends and colleagues and family. But maybe you have a bit of fear that kind of, does God really go after people who aren't Christians? Does he really? Maybe you can think, well, I would, perhaps I'd like to share about Jesus with people, but actually, sometimes I'm just afraid I've got it wrong. Maybe that's not what it's about, and maybe it's not worth pursuing people. We can have those fears. And God says to us tonight through this, be amazed, don't be afraid. God would come after the one, he'd come searching. So be amazed, not afraid. And then um, we turn to be amazed, not ashamed. Be amazed, not ashamed. So picking up from verse five again, back to the shepherds who's been searching for his one sheep. Verse five, and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. 
Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. And then verse nine, the woman, the coin, when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In summary here, if you are ashamed to repent, perhaps because the world mocks you about that, well, be amazed at how much God celebrates. Be amazed. Notice the eruption of joy here. Uh, the shepherd joyfully puts the sheep on his shoulders, joyfully. And just think of that, the shepherd with the sheep on his shoulders, you know, that is an image of sheer joy, isn't it? Sheer joy running home and then you have these further eruptions of joy you have both the shepherd and the uh, the woman they have these celebration parties with their friends and neighbors they just have a party and get everyone around there's joy there's celebration and uh, one commenter one commentator uh writes this when one is lost no thought is dearer than home when one is searching no thought is more pleasing than finding. Jesus is determined that the Pharisees get the point here. He makes it very clear in both parables. So verse seven, why am I telling you this, Jesus says? Well, I'll tell you that in that same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. In verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus could not be clearer. The sheer joy in heaven when a single sinner comes home to God. Uh, there's a quote from a boy who um, read this parable in a, a confirmation class and read it through. And what he said was, what a dumb woman. She spent more on the party than the coin was worth. Exactly. That, again, is the point. The joy of God has no price tag. Just spend wildly in celebration. So be amazed at how God extravagantly celebrates a single sinner coming home. Now, why do we need to know this? We need to know this, not least because the world, and especially the West, mocks repentance, let's be honest, a lot of the time. Repentance, the thought of turning back to God, coming home to God. The world, in the worst, would say that has no value. That is irrelevant at best. But actually, the world would often put it more strongly than that, that actually that repentance is almost an immoral thing itself. You know, repentance in some ways can be good. You know, we repent from um, abusing the climate, repent of racism. There's certain things that would be good to repent of. But in certain, when you bring God into the equation, repentance, no, that's immoral, actually. The way we should live our life is my way is the right way. Not about God. Repentance is kind of immature. It's immoral. And maybe you've kind of heard people kind of say things along those lines. I mean, we had a confession earlier in the service. I wonder if you can imagine saying a confession to God in front of your school friends or your work colleagues or your neighbours, whoever, you know. There is a chance that you would feel a bit ashamed at that point. I, I get that. And quite possibly you'd get laughed at. What are you doing? So what to do? What to do? Where well, to come back to God's prodigal love. Prodigal love again and again. So compare God's love to the world's love. The world won't come running after you like a crazy man. God does. The world won't throw a crazy party when you come home to God. God does. And consider also the prodigal love of Jesus Christ, specifically. Jesus Christ, crucified, 
when he was crucified, Jesus, he spent, he spent his love in his blood and he spent until he could spend no more because he died. Now, someone said it to me this way, that Jesus didn't tithe his blood. We talk about tithing at church. Um, when in church is word about giving 10% generally as a good principle uh, for church work, that kind of thing. Jesus didn't tithe his blood. He didn't give 10%. He gave it all. He gave it all. That's his prodigal love. Extravagant love. So be amazed at God's prodigal love. Don't be offended. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. As we finish, kind of just imagine, I find it helpful to imagine a huge reservoir. You know, the valley, a, a huge reservoir. It would take you at least half a day to walk around it, let's say. We can think of the size of God's love as small, as like going down to the reservoir with a kitchen ladle and just taking a spoonful of water out, a ladle full of water out of that. We can think of God's love that kind of size. But Jesus would have us here think of God's love this way. It's not a ladle full of water. It's bringing the dam wall down of the, of the reservoir. Bringing it down. All that water until the valley is dry. That's the scale of God's love. He's a, God is a wild spender. He gives everything in his love. So be amazed. Be amazed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you. You are beyond our wildest dreams. A God who would search for us and celebrate in this crazy, irrational way almost we've been hearing tonight. Praise you. We thank you that you would search for sinners, that you would celebrate us coming home. You would celebrate others coming home. People we don't even know yet will come to you in repentance, Father. And we're sorry that we grow cold to you. This uh, not understanding your love, it can go very deep for us and can linger. We treat you like a miser very often. It's very easy for us to do that. So help us, Lord. Help us to be amazed at your love for us and for others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.